Hey everybody, my name is Garrett Hartle. This is Reach Out Reptiles, and I'm sure by now all of you guys know that here at Reach Out Reptiles, we specialize in breeding nothing but dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons. When you guys get excited about that stuff, it's really cool to kind of go down that path together. And for those of you that come to me and you say, Garrett, it's like the most exciting day of my life. I just got a great deal on a really awesome pure super dwarf morph like an albino or tiger or platinum, 100% pure super dwarf, and it was way less money than I expected. I'm here to tell you, no. No, you didn't. You did not buy a pure super dwarf morph. They really don't exist. I'm gonna say that again. Pure super dwarf morphs do not exist. Now, for those of you guys that are quick to jump right in and counter knowledge with something that you've heard and you're already typing up, no, there's pure Superdor fanneries, go ahead and just delete that for a second and then hold off for a minute. We'll cover that as well. But first, let me tell you a quick story. This is an 87.5% Kalatoa, get some focus there, Kalatoa Platinum. She's uh, about a year and a half old already. Now, once upon a time, a little over a year ago, I was going to sell one of her brothers to a guy. I told him this is a great bloodline. They stay very small. It's a repeat breeding of breedings that I'd done before and watched as Guy got consistent results for small animals from this particular cross. Now, I'm just gonna make a number up here because I don't remember exactly, but I wanna say I offered the mail to him for something like $800 which I thought was a pretty good price after three generations of work. So the guy was very happy. He liked the results he saw in some of the older animals from the bloodline. He decided to go ahead and buy the animal. He said, let me get right back to you. He came back to me about three days later, very excited, and told me about how he had found actually a 100% Super Dwarf Platinum that was only $350. Well, right away, I asked him, did you buy it? Absolutely, he said. I, I bought it right up. It was at a reptile show from a guy I can't remember the name of. And, uh, you know, it was like half the price of getting one that was only 87.5% Super Dwarf. I asked if he could send me a picture of the new snake. Not only did it not look like it had any Super Dwarf blood in it at all, it wasn't even a platinum. Believe it or not, there are people who don't really know very much about the animals they're selling, they guess. But the pain of having a poor quality, misrepresented, missexed, whatever animal, and no one to go back to, is gonna hurt for a very long time. Especially if you actually follow through with raising and breeding the animal, only to find out it wasn't what you paid for in the beginning. Serious ouch. Now, the reason why it's impossible to find a 100% pure Super Dwarf Platinum is because Super Dwarfs are not a morph or a genetic mutation like some of these other animals that we're breeding. And a lot of people don't realize that. You see, Super Dwarfs come from a specific locality and Dwarfs come from a couple other very specific localities. So the only way to have a pure Super Dwarf is if the animals were never crossed into mainland animals to get a certain genetic trait into those pure island localities. And these islands are a pretty small place, so the chances of these morphs popping up in these islands are very, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just show you, all right? Come here. And in here is where retics live. Basically from here, just at the very bottom of like Bangladesh, all the way down into and almost touching Papua New Guinea over here. So all of Southeast Asia, really, all these islands here and all through here. If we go ahead and measure that, we will see, I'm just going to do this roughly, but we'll say from here to like down here, Timor area, we have about 3,000, almost 3,200 miles that this spans, a bunch of ocean and thousands and thousands of islands. Now from all of this area here in their range, we pull the few dozen morphs that we have in captivity. Now, the dwarf and super dwarf stuff come from, which way are we going here? Sulawesi, which is all of this area. Now, they're not from mainland Sulawesi, but rather this tiny little island chain right down here. So the dwarves and super dwarves are just, that's just a marketing term to cover 
some of these teeny tiny islands which are part of South Sulawesi. Actually, if we pull this up, bam, it'll actually show us a lot of data on Sulawesi. So you can see the area surrounding Sulawesi comes from all the way up here. This is the Philippines up here. So all the way up here to all the way down here. And it's just these tiny islands right in here that contain the dwarf locality. But this island here is Selayar Island, the largest island where the dwarf and super dwarf stuff comes from. And these retics are pretty closely related. They're actually genetically um, identical to, you'll see here, it's popping up the Bantaeng region, which are those, uh, those fairly rare uh, pure Sulawesi animals that I have. Uh, you may have seen before produced by my buddy Jonathan for the first time ever in captivity. Anyways, the, the DNA is identical from the Salear Islands to these southern mainland Sulawesi areas. Now, the rest of these islands is where we get kind of the traditional dwarf and super dwarf animals, which are distinctly their own subspecies. They're not this subspecies here, which is Malaya Python reticulatus saputrii, and they're not this subspecies down here, which is currently classified just as Malaya Python reticulatus reticulatus. These group of islands contain reticulatus jampianus, or the jampea pythons. And if we come in here, you will see this is jampea island. You, you will see tombolongans, uh, a little bit in captivity. They're all related to uh, something called a black-eyed candy, which was just a calico that came from these areas. Um, you'll see the Kiowatis, which are pretty close to the Jampea animals. But some of these Tombolongans and Kiowatis coming from these smaller islands could be considered super dwarves. Again, there's not really a definition for dwarf or super dwarf. And then way, way over here, are the three localities of the smallest reed ticks. This one is Madu, this one is Kalatoa, and kind of these two together are the Karampas. They come from Sulawesi. They're actually technically part of the South Sulawesi area. And if we look at this district, just uh, interestingly right here, you can see the actual population estimate between all of these islands is uh, six or seven thousand. And it, um, but as far as the ancestry of these animals, um, because they are split so much right through this line, I'm not sure about the Tombolongans. They kind of seem maybe to have a little crossover, but um, there's a, a big split in the retics between Jampea Island and Selayar Island, which has led to a lot of theories that they've actually come across this area but either way you look at it these are really remote areas i think their distribution is probably less of these actually were there and retics were there on land bridge they probably floated over from somewhere and kind of made their own species potentially from a mix of different localities but that's a silly thing to try to argue because nobody actually knows for sure we can't go back in time and watch these little snakes swim across the ocean this is what i wanted to show you though you remember we had over 3,000 miles covering that huge area where all these retics are mixing and we're getting all of our different genetic mutations. Then you have these tiny little areas. This one again, we don't have any retics in the US in captivity from there. But this little island, that little island, this little island, these tiny little islands, which again are, are really, really remote, is where everything's coming from. But let's take Madu for example. So this island here is only 3,000 feet across. Um, and then it's going to be, let's measure, so remind, remember that. 3,000 feet by 27,000, we'll say 28,000. Talking in generalities here, guys. Check this out. So to put that in terms for you, we got uh, 3,000 feet across. You're looking at a half a mile from top to bottom. And then we have, what did we say, 28,000? approximately 28,000 feet that way it's only five miles across so I mean literally this island here is two of New York City's Central Park Central Park is like a half a mile by two and a half miles 
So this is pretty much two central parts. And there's an entire locality that comes from here. This is why these guys are so rare. Um, if we zoom in, this is kind of cool. Let's take a look at the, the conditions here on Madu Island. Now, the first thing you'll notice, it's very small. I think the actual total elevation of this island is something like 60 feet. So, I mean, this is pretty much, you can kind of see at the seafloor here, these are underwater reefs here. So this is pretty much a reef that, you know, sticks up a little bit. Maybe some mangroves took hold, collected a bunch of dirt, and turned it into an island. Or maybe it was part of some land bridge once upon a time. Who knows? But it's very, very tiny. Deep. And you can see in here, there's almost no wild habitat left, even though there are very few people um, living here. These are just very simple, small houses. But if you, if you look, see these lines? That's not natural, guys. This whole area, look at the trees all in lines. These are probably coconut or palm that's being grown to sustain the people on these islands. So none of that is wild. And I'm sure that the, the retics are uh, appreciating all this habitat because with humans and palm plantations and stuff come rodents, there probably was very, very little food without those people bringing it on there to farm whatever they're farming. So there's Madu. You talk about a genetic, a limited genetic pool, you know, this little place here, it's a, it's, I'm sure there's a little crossover going between Madu and Kalatoa. The retics on one probably came from another at some point, but you're not getting a huge amount of genetic diversity. Now, all three of these little super dwarf islands uh, tend to have a high occurrence of the recessive gene anery or anerythristic, which lacks red pigment. Back in the day when I used to uh, participate in Mustang roundups, we would know that herds that had a lot of one color mutation, that shows us there's very little genetic diversity there. So these animals have a very limited gene pool. There's not a lot of surprises popping up. And so that's where you're gonna be. Now, Kalatoa Island is a little bit bigger, but this place here seems to have quite a bit more untouched uh, wooded areas, but it seems to be relatively untouched and it's a little bit bigger. Let's go ahead and measure this out of curiosity. This is the biggest of the Superdorf locality islands. And at its widest point, it's going to be 40,000, 41,000 feet and you're looking at just under eight miles across. So with no large rivers, no mountains, no volcanoes on this island, the retics that live there are gonna have free range of the whole thing. It's only eight miles across. So again, you're not getting like distinct localities within Kalatoa. They're pretty much gonna be the same. Teeny tiny. You're looking at less than half a mile across that thing. And uh, it looks like what, maybe three quarters of a mile. So very small. Um, I've heard rumors that the actual Corumpa locality animals come from here, which is Corumpa, Lompo, uh, Pulau, just means island, and, and that's it. These little, these little tiny islands that are basically just some trees on a reef out in the middle of the ocean have all that. Well guys, there you have it. And again, this is not meant to be some kind of huge scientific thing about localities and all that sort of stuff. I just wanted to give you a look at where these islands, these animals are coming from. Some of these localities exist on an island almost the same size as New York Central Park. So you can imagine there's not a lot of retakes there to begin with with the captive trade and there are still exportations, new imports from these tiny islands not coming to the US anymore but to some of these other places overseas and not very many people are breeding some of these localities, these you know grabbing hold of these few animals that we have and putting them together to ensure that these localities continue to exist in captivity. So pure locality stuff is very 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 rare and for you to find an albino or a platinum or a genetic stripe or any other mutation on those islands spontaneously 
would be really, really unlikely. And if it did happen, potentially like with the case of Annery, it would probably spread rapidly in such a small genetic pool. But I'm willing to bet you're probably not going to be able to buy one because the real good pure locality stuff is pretty hard to find anyway. Every time we get a new Annery line, from a wild caught animal, this same process has to happen where it really should be bred into other known annery animals to see if it actually reproduces itself or is it just a silvery looking animal from the get go. So that really hasn't been done very often and the people that used to breed and produce these anneries aren't anymore. It's actually one thing that we are really trying to bring back here at Reach Out Reptiles and we're working with some lines where anneries have popped up that potentially could be new lines of anneries. And so those lines are under development currently, but it's going to take a long time because we have to grow those females up and they're probably not going to breed until they're about five years old. So you have to be patient with that kind of stuff. And my hope is that that really puts in perspective for you just how special these awesome little animals are because of the amazing intelligence, adaptivity, and will to survive that they had. It's really pretty inspiring. And on that thought, have a great weekend.